also talk about other places besides Alaska, but mostly it's Alaska theme. There's a western sun in my eyes, so I had to put some sunglasses on. But welcome to this week's election coverage. Uh, oh, no, just kidding. All right, folks. <laughs> welcome back to the Mushing Alaska podcast. Here we go, baby. <laughs> uh, that's that's a, what a way to bring it in. You yeah, mentioned the uh, the election. Got to got to give it a shout out there. I got to got to love it. Hey, you know, in the entertainment business, my one political thing that I, you know, want to share with everybody is entertainment and politics just they don't they don't go together. All I'm so saying shout is... out shout out to all the bands that just go up on stage and and they just play their songs. Yes, yes, and stay yeah, out of those it. guys. Yeah. yeah. We're gonna play our song right now. All righty, folks. Anyways, um yeah, dude, how is your weekend going? It's Saturday. As Elton John said many times, Saturday, 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 <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> Saturday. It's Saturday. a good Saturday, man. It is a good Saturday here in Georgia. It's uh like a casual 75 degrees. I've got shorts and a t-shirt on and sweating right now because the air conditioning's not on. So yeah, there's that. Yeah. How's it going there in Alaska for you, pal? It's great, dude. I'm, I got my sunglasses on in, in November, dude. I'm I'm pretty stoked about that today. I'm I'm gonna we're gonna finish our little conversation and I'm gonna get outside and go for a long walk with my dog um but yeah it's been beautiful weather wish we had a little bit more snow up here it's funny how like uh it's funny how like there can just be like 20 inches of snow five miles away and then there's like no you know two inches of snow here the same night you know so you have like fairbanks they're just like they got an insane amount of snow since our last episode came out. And um, actually, like, we talked about that with Keaton, uh, that he's spent, you know, all day shoveling for a couple days. Cody Cody was uh, who's Keaton's uh, friend and, and helps him train dogs. He, uh, he was outside while we were having our recording with Keaton, and he was just, like, shoveling snow the, the whole time we were recording. And just would like look through the window and see Keaton cracking up and be like, oh, it looks like they're having a good time. I'll just go back to shoveling snow. You know, it's funny you talking about that and he was talking about it. You're talking about it now. And I'm just like things that I in Atlanta, Georgia, don't ever have to worry about. I mean, our stepdad, Gerald, lived in with his kids and ex-wife in uh, Colorado for the better part of a decade and basically moved to Atlanta it was like, I will never go back to a winter place because it's just like, so you just add, like you take how inconvenient all the inconveniences of life for you, Brendan, or for anybody. And then you add, Oh, now I got to wake up and, you know, get the snow off my car. And, you know, it, it's not for everybody. And certainly uh, isn't. Yeah. But that's why you can either pay people to do it, which I, or you just, it's good sweat equity. Or you just man know, up and, you know, know, sweat equity, baby. That's not sweat equity. That didn't make any sense. Sweat equity would be like if you build your cabin or whatever. Yeah. Well, not, you know, you're it's clear, not like equity, you know, clearing the driveway so that you can use it properly. It doesn't count as maybe that. No. Anyways, we, we've definitely digressed. So, uh, you know, there's not a lot going on for us to necessarily go over in this intro. And so we can kind of make it more of a quick intro. Um, and so, yeah, we are this this week's guest is uh, I did ride rookie Keaton Lobrick. And we had him on the other day and uh, we we thoroughly enjoyed our time with him. Uh, and so I'll turn it over to you, Sean. Well, what were some things that stood out to you about our time with Keaton? The entrepreneurial, which is a word I'm told, uh, mindset that he's had as, from for his whole life. I think that stood out to me. Uh, you know, he said he 
bought and sold 40 or 50 cars like by the time he was like 20 or something yeah like 18 like by the time he graduated high school or something i was like yeah that's pretty crazy i'm uh, yeah so like that's just a cool that that just gives you an idea you know he moved up here he went he was uh in the military for four years that'll you know get you get you that toughness that this lifestyle uh requires and then came up here learned about sled dogs worked with them for a couple years with a couple people and then was like okay cool i'll just uh move to fairbanks and buy some property get a job purchase some dogs run some races and sign up for ride to ride and like you know we come up with all these reasons why what i i I don't know if I want to do the idea Raj, or I don't know if I want to be a machine. He's just like, yeah, no big deal. I'm just going to get into this thing. And we all, you know, we've talked a lot about how difficult it is to get into this lifestyle. And it's, you know, very fi- financially pretty not smart. Uh, but, you know, he went and dove in head first. Um, and that's, I, I like that character trait in people. So it was cool, cool to hear from someone like that. Yeah, most certainly. And uh, uh, one thing that you'll hear in, in the interview with them is he's just got like a super upbeat attitude. Uh, he is just, you know, like he, I think he said he's 31, 32 years old. He's relatively green to like the, the mushing scene, you know, uh, like, you know, it it wasn't but two or three years ago until he first like uh, moved to Alaska. So it's just, you know, in a short amount of time, he's gone from deciding to move there to having his property, to having a kennel, to having 21 dogs. I'm just like, dang, I'm impressed for 31 yeah. years old. And uh, Quest 300s. Yep. You know, that'll, that'll take that the green label right off of you. Um, That's true. So. Yeah, it's a that's a that's a sounds sounds like they got a good just a good youthful energy um, there and excitement at, at at the kennel their stargazing stargazer kennel. Yep, and, stargazers, uh, stargazers, and so yeah, I think that's uh, it's good just to have that excitement, and youthful energy. There's nothing like your first time doing anything. And this is their first time training for a thousand miles. And uh, even though they've really been training for it ever since they've got their docs. Um, but it sounds like they've got a, a, a fun vibe there at, at Stargazers and, and some dogs that come from a bunch of different kennels, a bunch of different lines, uh, and kind of have like a, like a hodgepodge group of dogs that are come from like they're not i don't think they've ever had the puppies from they're all you know been adopted as adults the dogs and so that is cool that how they are gonna have to create this team and when you're bringing in a bunch of free agents to get all be you know so to speak because i I, I can only think of it in sports terms you know brennan and i love baseball and basketball and football. So we think of, you know, signing a free agent to your team, but this is just like creating a new franchise and you're bringing all these players that have been in the league and creating a new team and see how they mesh together, you know, with, and, uh, and that's, that's what I think of with what they've got going. And, and that's a, like brings a unique set of challenges. And, and I think they've already through the last couple of years created that, you know, team environment with their dogs and, and, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to see uh, how it goes for them this season. And, uh, you know, one of many rookies and that have been around the scene, some of them, and some of them new, uh, to it. And so that's cool. It's cool to see. Yeah. And you know, yeah, go ahead. One thing that I thought was uh, interesting that you pointed out was that your friend, his friend Cody, that's helping him right now, has already trained with 
uh, Matt Pavalio, who's someone who's done the Iditarod before. So although Keaton, you know, doesn't have like the thousand miles uh, race experience, we'll say um, he's got someone in his in his corner that has been a part of the training to lead up to the Iditarod. And so I'm sure that that'll be a very kind of useful and handy as as they get into the the thick of the season leading into the Iditarod. Um, but yeah, Stargazers Racing is their social media, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and uh, you can certainly follow them there. Um, but yeah, we hope you all enjoy this uh, interview with Keaton, the 2025 Iditarod rookie. And until next time, y'all enjoy. All righty, folks. Welcome back. Uh, we've got our next guest with us, a Didrod rookie, Keaton Lobrick. Welcome on. And, uh, well, how's it going, man? Yeah, man. Nice to uh, meet you guys and be on here. It's going really good. I mean, training's starting to pop off. We got, I don't know, over two feet of snow in the last couple of weeks. So we got a whole bunch of snow here and on sleds and just rocking and rolling. Dogs are looking. I'm I'm getting super, super excited about this training here for sure. That's, That's awesome. awesome. What uh, what part yeah. of t- where are you located? So we're in Fairbanks, in North North Fairbanks, off uh, Old Murphy Dome on the Elliott side. We got really good training here. Lots of lots of hills. Elevation is pretty crazy. I mean, just leaving where we're actually located to get to the trails is like a 500 foot gain. So they're gonna have a lot of hill training on them. So that's. I also do tours for trail breaker uh during the winter time so i'll be going down there and running a lot of river miles after those tours on the tanana is the plan to get those those flat miles as well so that's the goal right now brennan the trail breaker kennel i believe is the uh the susan butchers the legacy kennel you know the family right is am i not mistaken yeah. Yep, Susan Butcher, so Tackle, her daughter's on it now, David Munson, who was Susan's husband, also a 1988 Yukon Quest champion. I feel like he's not going to get enough credit <laughs> for that because he was married to one of the best mushers, if not the best mushers to ever do it. So I always like to shout that out. Anytime he comes in when I'm doing tours or whatever, I just like, we'll stop her and go, this is David Munson. And I'm just say all that. And he's, I don't know, probably not used to that, but he's a really good guy too. So. That's good to give the, those people the credit. If there's anything like me, which I like, a lot of mushers are, where you where someone mentions like, "Yeah, this guy is, uh, you know, so and so finisher, this guy," and they're like, "God damn it, Keaton, shut up, dude!" <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. I, so they do like the dinner tours there. So there's the one time he'll come in like just to eat because they get catered food. So it's like I try to get dinner here. And then he'll just like try to sneak it in. I'll stop everything. Like I have all 50 people like turn around and like recognize them. They're like, oh, they clap. And he's like trying to eat, whatever. But <laughs> I mean, I was about like quest champion. Like that's something to say to Susan. Like so much gets talked about the fact that she dominated at Dinner Rod in the late 80s, early 90s. But she also like took a team of dogs and summited Mount Denali with. You know, Joe, right? Like, it's just, I don't know. That could be a whole thing in itself. The fact that she won that dinner odd so many times, like, that doesn't even get talked about. So, I don't know. I don't know. There's I, a lot of history in that channel for sure. I, I definitely, I remember, well, I got a chance to s- sit down with Ryan Reddington and talk about that a little bit while, while we were at the Copper Basin this year and, and, okay. uh, and handling and stuff. And I was just like, man, what a crazy, like, I, you know, going, there was, there's videos of them getting like, you know, lifted, the dogs got to get lifted through certain spots if they're, you know, that aren't mushable. And I don't know, I like, I, I, I don't, I don't understand. It does like, I have so many questions about it. Like, I mean, how many, I think it was like this, like you're getting mushing the whole way or you kind of sometimes let them run loose a little bit. Do like when you're going downhill, do you really want them climbing down the damn thing? You know, like, yeah. You'll freak out about Eagle. I mean, that's literally the tallest spot in North America. Just take it. Yeah. Up. But you know? yeah, I mean, the dogs, and that's what's the crazy part is like they didn't, the dogs didn't need that acclimatization like humans do, you know, because they were in such good shape because they had run Iditarod and Quest and maybe even like Kobuk. I don't know. And, and then they go out there into the high, 
elevation and they're just like completely unfazed you know um going pulling up you know all those thousands of feet you know yeah that is a crazy what a crazy i, I just i would love to get what's yeah. that what these sweat dogs are capable of is just unbelievable it blows me away and it starts me more and more like the more i realize and can see what they are actually capable of it's just unbelievable I mean, I I feel like going on like the first forty, and then I'm being like, "Holy shit, that is a long time!" Like forty miles, and then like then a, maybe a week or two later, you do like a forty, and then like the next day you do a four. I'm like, "God, I like this is a lot," you know. And then you realize like they're gonna run a thousand miles. You know, it's just like once you ramp it up, and then like coming to a checkpoint, like like you you can last year coming to two rivers, like that's. I don't know, 40 something mile run. And they're just like jumping in the harness, like ready to go. Like, that is like the most exciting thing for me as a musher. Like, coming to a checkpoint and like they don't want to stop at all. Like, that's. Oh, like I said, I'm excited about these dogs this year, man. They're looking really good right now. We just ran our first, uh, I don't know, probably like 34 miles a couple of days ago. And they are ripping. Like I said, that's with the elevation we have here, too. So, my flat nice. land is probably close to. You know, 40, 40 plus though. So. Yeah, you're yeah. looking good. I'm excited. Yeah, Brandon and the uh the old Murphy Dome is kind of like seem from my from my little understanding of the whole Fairbanks mushing machine, but it, it, that that there that is a, a lot of people live in that little neighborhood. There's two sides to it and it's high elevation, so it has warmer temperatures because of the inversion. So you don't have to yep. like when it's fifty below in Fairbanks, it's like twenty five or thirty below there, which is kind of nice. The, you know. Yep, above the inversion layer. But so we've been up here. This is our third winter up here now. My first winter, like, if you want, you can just run the ridge line. You get all the miles. You can stay in, you know, negative five, negative 10, negative 15. But then you drop down the valley. Like, the, the craziest we've seen is, is we left the kennel. It was like negative five, drop down in the cabin or down in the valley, cross over the Chattanooga, and it was like 50 below. So like a 50, 45, 50 degree yes. difference. So you gotta be prepared. You gotta have extra gear for yourself and the dogs for sure. But two years ago, like we would try to stay on the ridge line and avoid it. Last year, it's like now I just try to find like those intense conditions. So like if it's 50 below in the valley, like that's where we're going. That's where we're training. That's why I was so excited last year when the quest was 50 below. You see all these people that are pulling out of races. Like that's what we train for. I mean, that's ideal conditions realistically. Like I don't know. Yeah, that's uh, that's a t- it's tough tough conditions, and when you go down into that, it's like a, a wall of just hits you in the face. You're like, oh, this feels a little different, and then yeah, you so check your thermometer, and you're like, ah, that makes sense. So where we're at, there's two ways you can dip down to the valley from here. One's like the lake trail; it's kind of long, evenly downhill. The other ones, you take the pipeline down, and people call it Pucker Hill, and it's like an instant twelve hundred foot drop. So you're instantly, I'd much rather do that all day long because you're going right into it. You know what it's going to be. When you're gently coming down, it's like a 12 mile run, and you're like, just keeps on getting colder and colder and colder, just like psychologically. You're like, I don't know how much colder you're going to get. I'd rather <laughs> all at once and just be done with it and ready to rock and roll. So nice. Yeah. So uh, you're signed up for this 2025 I did a ride. You've qualified. Of course, that's a requirement. One, uh, two, three hundreds and a 150. Um, and yep. we were talking about before we started recording, I don't know what your qualifiers are, but one of them certainly sounds like was the quest 300. Am I right? Yep. So I ran the quest around for the last two years. Uh, I ran five mid distance races so far. So I, my first race was little 300, like less than a week after that, I ran Yukon quest 300 last year and we ran the Percy DeWolf two years ago. Uh, and then last year I ran Yukon Quest 300, which was the premier race on the Alaskan side last year. And then the T Dog, which was put on by Tekla and Trailbreaker. And that was, I wish that would have been my first mid distance race. Like that is, was a super chill, relaxed, like most, like as much of a fun run that you can have for mid distance race. So my wife, the science just actually opened up. My wife signed up. That's going to be her first mid distance race, her first qualifier. So, like, I'm super excited. I'm super excited to be able to handle for Erica. Like, I can't wait to see her coming to a checkpoint and, like, have to go through everything, like, all the different emotions and, like, I can just be there supporting her and, like, pay back everything that she's done to 
helped me get where we are. So, yeah, you guys got married this year, right? Or we did, year? yeah, this year. No, it was this year. Yeah, May eighteenth of this year. Ah, it congratulations! Like, yeah, it feels like it's been a lifetime ago, even though it's almost <laughs> not even six months. I mean, this summer, it's been. You mean it, you, you're year supposed year. to say it went back? It went. It's gone in the blink of an eye. I can't believe it's already it's been, been six been months. Really good between us. I mean, our relationship oh, yeah, yeah. has been phenomenal the entire time. It's just been a crazy summer. We built this cabin we're in right now. Pretty much all this summer, and then just as soon as we got done with that, moved in, and then like started training. So it's been nonstop pretty much since we got dogs. But and so, we love that. Uh, so I'm a little curious about just kind of uh, you know how long you've been in Alaska, and you know on the uh, I did a rod page, you know it says you're from Michigan. So I'm just kind of like. If you can give us maybe the little the condensed, and you're also wearing a Vikings hat, so I'm yeah, I have questions. On. I have questions. Uh, so well, just fill the blanks there. The line, so I <laughs> oh yeah, never the only the only team I've ever rooted for from Michigan is University of Michigan. I tell you, I root for from Michigan. So I've always been I've been a Vikings fan for a long time. Now prior to that, I was actually a Packers fan because of Brett Favre. I was a Brett Favre fan. I loved like his style of playing football, just that gunslinger mentality, just going for a touchdown every single play. Like, you know, he might, when he retired, he had all the records for a quarterback, most touchdowns and most interceptions because he just didn't care. So then when he moved on to the Vikings, they had that magical run in 2009 like that. I remember week four when they were playing San Francisco, Frank Gore, like they were supposed to be the hot team and we came back and, he threw a touchdown pass with like four seconds left in the back of the end zone. That was like, all right. We went four and oh, ended up going six. You know, I think we finished like either 13 and three and 12 and four, went on the NFC championship thing. And I remember, Brett Favre, I've been, I, Brett Favre yeah. threw an intersection. And we I were saw, in field goal range. Went, went overtime, never touched the ball. Saints went down, kicked the field goal. They won. Yeah. But I, th- I think I saw some interview in the not to get, we're going to get real lost in the NFL because I love talking about sports. But the uh, the Favre and he's like, yeah, I got I think it was in that NFC championship. He got his ass like knocked and he like was out completely out yeah. like snoring. And uh, yeah. and then he like got up and he's like, I think I need to go in the locker room. And he like like ate a hot dog and walked walked you know took a shower and never, and that was the end of his career you know was that final concussion is what he is what i had learned and i was like oh yeah that, yeah, that I was think a, that hit head a couple times that's prime yeah, bounty gate year, era yeah yeah that was yeah the next so speaking of which so, like i was from michigan huge Brett far fan and that after that game that was the next year it was like week uh i don't know it was towards the tail end of the season and he was the Iron Man, like started 492 consecutive games or whatever. But we finally bought, no, it wasn't even we bought tickets. It was the free game because the dome collapsed in Minneapolis. The day they were supposed to, or like the night before, they were supposed to play the Giants in Minneapolis. So they actually moved the game to Detroit, made it a free game, like gave away the tickets for all the season ticket holders and all these other people. I actually bought one of those tickets, drove down. It was the first game I ever been to, and it was the first game in Brett Favre's career that he did not start. Oh my god! And then he came back. He came back the next week and played. And then the season finale, they were playing Detroit Lions in Detroit. So if I buy tickets, it's gonna be his last game. They didn't start that game either. So my first two games were the first two games he didn't start. But I don't know. It's Brett Favre. Well, hey, he's he's he got his Super Bowl at least, and had you know a hall of fame career so you know yeah. we're happy for brad yeah yeah as a football player yeah. yeah yeah nice so you grew up in michigan what did you grow up yeah. like what was your like lifestyle growing up because like you know you built you just built your own cabin with your help of your family and friends maybe but yeah like how are you just like up here and you just kind of you know i'm sure you're learning a lot up here but you also probably had kind of that go-getter can-do attitude growing up i would think or at least you learned it Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've always been kind of a go-getter entrepreneur. Like, I would always, I mean, when I was a kid, I used to just walk up and down the road and, like, pick up people's trash and, like, resell it. And, like, I would go and, like, walk people's dog. I was always 
big into dogs. That's all for my mom too. She used to watch dogs from people at work whenever they go on vacation or whatever. She'd watch all their dogs. And like, I'd start acquiring some of those like people. And when they brought, you know, when Tom first came over, like I was watching Tom, you know what I mean? Like that's kind of, I was always making money. And I mean, when I, when I was a kid, I wanted to be rich growing up. And which is funny now because I mean, <laughs> a bunch of rich You blew it? A star from being rich as possible. Like I said, I, I said this all the time when I'm on my tours. I got a degree in finance, and this is absolutely insane. This goes against everything I went to school for. It's just nuts to come in and mush and own dogs and do everything that's involved with the sport. But yeah, I mean, I was always hustling. I mean, I bought and sold cars. I bought my first car in fifth grade. And by the time I graduated, I probably bought, sold like over 40 or 50 vehicles. And then after graduating high school, I joined the Marines. I kind of always knew I was going to do that. And that was a really good experience for me. I was in the infantry as a machine gunner. And like all that training I did in the Marines, like directly coincides and fits with everything I do much. So I try to like, do the same sort of train. Like when we're in the Marines, we train like we play. When I'm training dogs, I'm training like it's a race. If I'm not going to do what we're going to do in a race, I'm not going to do that for training. Like somebody brought up, because we got to run the road right here. When we come into our kettle and it's cloud and it's like insane that we got like this hard 90 degree turn to like come in our out trail. And like somebody's like, well, why don't you just hook up? When you get down your out trail and you start going on the road, hook up the and slow them down. It's like, when are we going to do it on a race? Like, why? I do that. It's not going to help me train. If it's not going to be in the race, it's not going to be in, like in my training. So that's kind of how I train myself, the dogs, the kennel, and everything because of my time in the Marines. So that's been a big help. And then I was in the Marines for four years. Again, I was a ski gunner. I was stationed in Camp Pelican, California. Uh, went on employment. Uh, and then once I got out of the Marines, went back home, went back to Michigan, went to a community college out of pocket for a couple of years before transferring to the university of Colorado where I was studying for astrophysics. So I was always very interested in space and astronomy and yeah, I was paying for it. And one time I was stationed in Camp Pendleton and I'm from Michigan. So I drove through Colorado and just absolutely fell in love with this. So I knew I wanted to live there at some point, got the chance to do while I was going to school. And I'm glad I got that out of my system and found Alaska, honestly, because Alaska is like Colorado on steroids with right. way less people. Yeah. But while I was yeah. going to school there, like I said, I was always interested in space and astronomy. And when after doing it for two years, I kind of realized, while I'm interested in it, I don't want to pursue a career doing that. So basically, I dropped out and went back home, uh, linked up with a couple buddies from the Greens that were working for a company called Event Link. We did promotional events for like Porsche, BMW, Audi. Uh, we travel all over the country, set the events, run the events, tear them down. You work like three weeks on every single day and then you have like a week off and do it again. And it was a really fun time. I did that for about a year and a half, right until COVID hit, all that shut down. And then I was like, well, what, what am I going to do now? And I was like, yes, this is actually a perfect time to go back to school because everything's going to be online. It's going to be I mean, really pretty easy, honestly. So that's, that's what incentivized me to go back to school. I saw I still had enough time left on my GI Bill. And then basically just put in uh, an application to Central Michigan. And I was like, if I get in, I get in. If I don't, I don't. Because when I dropped out of Central or University of Colorado, I literally went to all my professors. And I was like, hey, like, don't withdraw me. Fail me. Because if you would draw me, I got to pay back like all the job bill and the housing allowance and all that. I did not have the funds to do that. So I was like, just fail me. I'll take the app. Like my GPA will be crap, but it won't matter because I'm probably not going to go back to school. It was my mindset at the time. Uh, but applied to Central Michigan, got in. And then the first semester, I think I was on like the Dean's list. I have like a 4.0. And then went to the, well, first I went to my counselor and I was like, hey, these are the credits I have. Like, what? degrees can I get as fast as possible? And then they're like, well, if you do this course, you're like, you know, four years. And I was like, no, 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 like fast, like go, go summer, spring, fall, like every semester on top of each other, I'll take as many credits as possible. Just, I need to get this done as fast as possible. And with the job though, I mean, you can take 
as many credits as want as you want, and it's not there, and they'll basically pay for it. So that's what I did. And there's, I could have got a math degree because I already had all the stuff for uh, physics, all all the math classes for that. Really, I don't really want to do that. And then finance was one. I was like, like I said earlier, I was incentivized and like wanted to make money. I was like, that many slots spent, so I ended up doing that degree and. Now I'm just looking at all, you know, the cost of everything. And I don't know, last year I looked at it a lot more. Like now, I mean, if you own dogs, like it has to be every aspect of your entire life. And now it's just like, all right, I made this much money. That's X amount. I bought this much dog food. Like that's just what, like, it's money isn't a thing now. If we got enough money for the dogs and for the food and like for slides and gear, like, that's it. That's all we needed. That's all we got. We got, we got food. We got generator running for electricity to do stuff like this. And that's all we need. And I've never been more happy. So that's awesome. That's Where we're at. Sponsored by Honda generator. <laughs> <laughs> this <laughs> podcast. You're the spot. Go ahead. Yeah. So how did I get to Alaska? I kind of went on a little rabbit hole there. But. No, well, it's good to know like the, the full story. Cause it makes like, I was like, just hearing the very little story, bit about your story from Cody, our mutual friend, <laughs> he, um, and just knowing that, like, yeah, you worked at Husky Homestead, like I had here in Denali, and then you just like kind of went to Fairbanks, got a property, married your wife, got dogs, and one of those or maybe different order, but um, you know, yeah, that's just so like when, when I- now in twenty twenty four to like go and do what you just have started and you're doing is really really like you're not seeing a lot of people taking that journey in 2024 because it is super expensive you know to get property up here relative to what it was in 1990 or whatever or 2004 even and uh and of course the dogs and the dog food and the dog gear and the price of of two by four you know everything is just 40 to 80 percent more expensive depending on you know, what you're comparing it to yep yep so yeah so i actually came up here though is one of my summer my second summer break while i was at central michigan i came across the job ad we're doing jeep tours down the nally highway and i was like that sounds like a good idea that sounds fun i've never been to alaska before in my life but that sounds interesting because I'm not one to work in an office. And I kind of knew that while I was getting a finance degree. But so I saw that, came up here, flew up to Anchorage. It was the first time I ever been in Alaska. Took the train up to Denali. And by the time I got off the train, I fell in love with Alaska and knew I was going to be moving up here eventually. And then that first week, Erica was working at Jeeps as well and was like the office manager. So met her. And then we started dating. I don't know, probably like a month, month and a half after that. So was introduced. And then in that first week, I was, our Jeep site was right next to the Husky Homestead. I mean, so met Jeff, met Cody, was introduced to that, became really good friends with them and pretty much everybody working there. And it's like, all right, that's what I want to do. And then like the last, I wanted to stay there that, that first winter, but like I said, I already dropped out of college once and I knew. If I dropped out again, I was never going to get my degree. So I took everything I had to get out of the plane, actually go home and finish my degree. But that's what I did. And then while I was doing that, I got Erica basically did a job working at Husky Homestead. So she handled that full first winter or her, her first winter um, at Husky Homestead with Jeff and Amanda and getting some more experience and all that. So I knew it was like, all right, this is what we're going to do. So we're going to do it. And that was like the first step. So she was astronomical and kind of setting the foundation and figuring everything out. And then as soon as I graduated the next day, I mean, we were loaded up in our view with like everything we, we owned and drove up to Denali and worked for Jeff that first summer. And then had a couple different opportunities uh, for mushing that winter was wanting to stay at Husky Homestead. I mean, Jeff King has really good dogs, but he basically said like, Hey, like, you can stay here if you want, but like, if you really want to be a musher and like go run dogs, you're not going to get a whole opportunity here. Like I can get anybody I want to come here and run dogs. Like, and I already got pretty much who I, who I want and need right now. So I was like, all right. I mean, I appreciate you being involved with me and went and looked at different 
Daniels and end up coming to one up here in Fairbanks. And the owner of the kennel was super good to us. And she basically had dogs for her kids so they could run junior. I did her on and was like, here's the kennel. Go train them. Figure out everything you need to figure out. And just make sure they're ready for junior I did around. They're like, all right. Like, that's how I really learned everything is just going and figuring it out. I mean, like I said, that's the best training you can possibly get. You go out and the dogs get tangled up and you don't know what you're doing. I mean, the dogs taught me more than probably anything, but you get through those situations. The more you do it, the better you get at it. That's how we got where we are realistically. And then after that first year with her, the next summer, she was like, all right, I'm downsizing my kennel. I can't really afford to keep these dogs just for my kids, basically. So she ended up, we basically took, acquired seven dogs from her and then kind of got a handful of dogs elsewhere. And initially, we were just going to have like a kennel of eight and run some smaller races. And just got to get more races under my belt and then end up having 14. And it was like, all right, well. We got 14. The The quest was, the 300 was the rear race for the Yukon quest. And I was like, well, I ran that last year, my first year. So, I mean, might as well shoot for that and make that our main goal. And that's what we did. And the dogs did really good and super excited. And now we got 21 and our run I did around this year. So, and we're super excited about that. I think. How, how old are you? Yeah, thank you. I'm 31. 31. I was like, okay. it's like you sound like you're like 60 based on the experience you've had up to now. Not in the little amount of time as possible. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yes, that's. I mean, yeah, wow, my man. first year of mushing, I really I worked for what four kennels on 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 that first year and saw like how different ways of doing things. It kind of took what you liked and left what you didn't, and then kind of put that all together. And, so is that like, do you have a friend or a, like, obviously you've gotten some awesome experience from these kennels and they've, and drawn from their people and the dogs that are, you know, very experienced, but right now, are you like, you know, you're leaning into Iditarod. Do you have like somebody who's an Iditarod veteran, maybe that you're just, you know, trying like to get a mentor or something weeks? To say, hey, you know, this is what, you know, or you feel like you've got a good grasp on things. Or I feel both. like I, I do have a, a good grasp on things. There, there are definitely people in the community that I know that I could reach out and ask questions. Uh, and like ultimately right now, just like getting your, you're just getting your base of mileage. You're not like, you know, you're not, you're this, you've done all this already time and time again, you know, and it's not, and you're going to see them at the races and you'll see them at, you know, you'll see them later in the winter, but I've just figured, you know, you get into that like next level of like three to 600 miles into a training run, or, you know, in this case, it'll be the idea rod. And that's like uncharted territory for every rookie and no one's run it, you know, 800 miles straight as a, you know, before they go and run the idea rod. It, it, they have, I think like Mila Porsche maybe, and like a few other rookies maybe, but for the most part, you know, like, have you talked to, you know, some people about that breaking, like, you know, after that 24, that middle third and second third of the race, like, you know, I haven't, I haven't, no, I mean, like I said, there's people that are out there that I know I could, I mean, honestly, on my downtime now, I've been watching a bunch of, I did a rod docs. So I feel like there's nice. a lot of good, I mean, there's a flow to the race that especially like, I mean, once you get towards, you know, Clint, you kind of know, I mean, who the front runners are going to, like, I, I don't know. There's a flow to the race. Like, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not concerned about it. Like, same thing with around the quest. Like, as a rookie, you don't know what you don't know. And that's it's not, true. that's not a bad thing. That's, if anything, that's a benefit for us is the way I'm looking at it. Because just like when I ran the quest the first year, I didn't even know we went over Rosebud. Until I came into 101, and then people were asking about it. I was like, oh, that was that giant right. mountain that I just summited yeah. and then descended. You're going into this <laughs> but you guys are going to We're never going to make it up. You go. I just freaking out. I was like, all right. 
there's no there's no sign that says welcome to rosebud (laughs) yeah all i know for every race you follow the trail markers you're gonna be fine i don't know you know what i mean like for sure navigating isn't really isn't like that we tough i'm very confident in the way we train dogs here i try to put myself and the team in every condition possible if it's you know, 50 mile per hour gusts and windy like crazy, which we get pretty crazy windstorms here. Like that's, I'm getting excited now. Like we're loading up and running dock. Like that's Heck yeah. really good fucking training. You know what I mean? Like, absolutely. Like I don't know, earlier this week, I did two 25 mile runs and my sled broke on the first run. I came back, repaired it, got a team ready, took the other team out and went. Like that's really good training. Like that's been our mantra. You can ask Billy. That's been our mantra. For everything, any situation we get into, that's just good training. The more fucked up it is on the run, the better <laughs> training it is. I mean, we got it that is two true. feet of snow. <laughs> we got that two feet of snow, and the trails were unpassable, not just from the snow, but for all the trees that were down. And we spent three days just shoveling and plowing the driveway so that Eric can get out every day, and didn't weren't able to run the dogs because that was priority. We got to have some source of income to actually pay for all this. So then, it was like, I was like, all right. Like, got around the docks so i didn't have a chance to like go clear the trails or anything and it was the first time on sleds that i was like we we're gonna take bigger teams but i probably was like all right let's just take two teams of seven because we're gonna be clearing trails i had a chainsaw with me and i knew we were gonna cut down trees and then right when you got in the trails like stop the team i mean you couldn't set a hook because it was all unpacked trail and then the dogs the, the dogs couldn't go any forward because there was a tree so it was like all right and then Got a chainsaw out of the bag, started up, started to cut. As soon as I started up, like the dogs freaked out, like turned around and like split and then like got all tangled up. And then I'm like, yo, can already come up? He's like, I can't get off. I can't get off the foot. And I was like, all right. So then just lined him out, probably got him untangled. And I was like, all right, can't use the chainsaw. And just got on a handsaw and like cleared a mile and a half out trail that we have here. It took like three and a half hours just to clear that. And the dogs, I mean, I haven't ran in three days, so they're hyped up. They just got out of the chute and like are barking and like going crazy and you just gotta be calm and push through it and like it's good training. I don't know. Yeah, so it's good like, training. Yesterday, yeah. or two days ago there was a tree down and I was like, Oh, it's only one tree. Got the axe out, cut it out, moved it all away, got a sled and went. Like it's you know, so now I don't know. That's just the way I am with like everything. Like yeah. the more just like, gonna try to get is, into it. Just dive in head first. You know, something's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. And yeah, you've, you've got the, the knowledge and equipment and gear to figure it out. It sounds like, and yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's great. Cause you obviously, yeah, you've been in these races, you've been in those situations during the events, but it's good to be doing that during training too. Cause yeah, I, it, it never, it's just a smooth carpet ride. I mean, it has been for some mushrooms, but it 99% of them. No. The, I've never been in a race where there's not been major issues. Yeah. I'll have every trainer run be absolutely perfect, have no issues whatsoever, and then the first mile of a race, like everything just goes wrong. So like <laughs> now, like when main trainer run, everything goes wrong. Like I get excited instead of just like getting Ugh. upset or getting angry, getting frustrated. Like I just like, all right, this is awesome. This is happening now. So at least like me and my dogs that seeing this can conquer it. And, you know, and for the dogs' confidence too, like their pride, like just knowing that they're capable. If they listen to me, do what I say needs to be done, I can get them through anything. Like having that relationship is like super important to me. Absolutely. Have have you had any like uh any big oh shit moments either in a race or training? Like that kind of oh, st- I mean, he just described like seven of them, I feel like, but yeah, go. I'm sure there's even a worse one. Yeah, oh, yeah. So probably the biggest one was last year training. Uh, so we got like the birch tree loop here that runs off the pipeline and you either do a loop around that or you can G down this downhill trail and it has like another five miles. So usually my dogs want to do what we did the last time we went out. So that's what I was expecting them to do. Last time we went down, we G down that downhill trail. For whatever reason, my lead dogs are like, all right, we're going to do this loop. So I stopped the team. I think the lead dogs had just passed the turn. I was like, gee, gee, gee. They're like, all right, they're not going. So I set both hooks, but there was like in the area where it was that I stopped the team. 
because of all the tree cover, there wasn't like a whole lot of snow underneath. I couldn't set a good hook. I set one on the ground, like put one on a tree. I, I hate putting snow hooks on trees. I've never had very good success with that. So I really am reluctant to do it. And looking back, I should have just done the loop and then came back around and went again, but didn't do that. So then walked in, started walking in front of my team. And like, you know, we walked down the trail, like, and like oh, we're going that way. So they're like, oh, we're going that way. And then yeah. the whole hooks came went done. And like, they actually tripped me. So I'm on the ground and then like the sled goes by and the snow hook just caught my neos perfectly, like right on the strap and just started pulling me behind them. Going downhill, I had like, I don't know, I think I had 14 dogs. And we we're they were just ripping. It was like the first probably ten miles into the run, super excited. And I'm just like screaming, whoa. Like as it's happening, I'm just like thinking, like, all right, best case scenario, I'm walking away with a broken leg. Because there I had no control. Like this I was just like literally dodging trees and everything, like jamming my hands into the snow as much as I could to try to slow them down, but they they were just ripping. And then I don't know, it probably dragged me, it felt like forever, but like literally like three miles downhill and then finally like the sled went up on a berm and like i came to a stop and was able to undo that and like all right my ankle is pretty fucked up but all in all i'm okay i actually shut the snow hook like went and, like all right dogs like i'm down a little bit more calm myself down <laughs> and then got back on the sled and continued i think i was doing like a 50 mile run continued the rest of the run and then no broken leg no broken leg like Damn. my ankle was a little twisted but i mean i was super fortunate and then like same thing like that just gives me more confidence like going forward like if you can do that like my first training run ever was uh the christmas when erica was handling for jeff and amanda i came up here for the christmas break and we that was when you got like five foot of snow to now in between christmas and new year's it was like that record breaking snowfall. So we went out for a run and my first turn ever, I ate shit. And I was like, that's awesome. Now I don't have to worry about that. Like that's nothing. Got to slide up and kept going. Like, all right, that's nothing. I can do that. So like, I just love that kind of stuff. Nice. That's awesome. So you've been, you've been living in Alaska since like 21, 22. Is that kind of what I've put together? Yep. So you, you've done a lot in a short amount of time. You've got your team going. Uh, so talk about like where, what, what, uh, what's your season looking like heading into the Adirad yeah, this year? Honestly, I don't know. So the goal is I did The goal is to finish. I did it. That's the main goal and priority right now. The only other race that we signed up for right now is the T dog for my wife. Um, that's going to be post. I did a rod. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know. And the same thing you talk to any mocker, you get different opinions on what races to run. Like I said, I don't, there's a dual X silver to run these other races because they are good trainer runs. Yukon Quest, I've been on the fence about that running the 550. Uh, because if I, if I was to run it, I'd run just like a trainer run and be super conservative or at least attempt to, right? I know, like, every musher says you're going to do that, and then you get to the race and tell you see, like, you're resting, and then you see all these teams go by, and you're like, all right, neither you start getting another race. But, so right now, I don't know, I'll think about potentially uh, the Copper Basin looks enticing because that's six weeks before I did a rod. So, if a couple dogs do get banged up, they'll kind of recover, hopefully, be on the race team. But, I don't know. We'll just see what it shakes out. I don't think any races have enough incentives for me personally to sign up on opening day. Uh, I think the closer you get to race day, the better you are informed of your team, how the team's looking. Uh, we, we have, I mean, a relatively small kennel too, so we don't have a whole lot of depth. So I don't want to, again, bang up potentially I did ride finishing dogs on a mid distance race that, you know, Really, we have not a whole lot to gain from. But, I mean, there is a lot to gain from every race. I mean, even just on the logistical side, the more you can get all that down, the better as far as getting drop bags ready, like mentally prepared for what you need at each checkpoint, the strategy of the race, like all those things that combine together for a thousand mile race, especially like is, is always good, good training. Uh, but right now, if I was to run a race, it'd probably either be the Copper Basin or like the Quest 550, maybe the 200. 
I don't know. I don't know. There's one person chance for the 200 right now. And yeah, the reality is, you know, like a lot of the people that sign up for all these races, you know, probably 10 or 20 percent of them won't end up running it for one reason or another, right. you know. So you can say you got this plan, that plan, but like sounds like you got a good approach with just uh, take things as they come. See how the dogs are moving and looking and what the forecasts are. Are we going to deal with 60 below or is it, you know, good trail conditions? You know, you always can do these 300 mile pushes on your own in the White Mountains or, you know somewhere yeah. in the Fairbanks area and not have to do it in an event, you know, and a lot of mushers wow. would say that that's the best just for the dogs. And others say, ah, oh, it's good to get the drop bag process figured out and go and do it in a supportive environment where you have these veterinarians there and mark the trail. And so, you know, yeah, there's lots of, lots of, ev- everyone's got their own opinion. You show up, they're all like, oh, I would never, I would never use this kind of harness. I would never yeah. use that kind of sleds too heavy. Oh, uh, I would never these booties. Oh, I can't use the Velcro booties with the stretchy part. I don't like the stretchy parts too stretchy. I don't want yeah. the stretchy. You know, it's like everybody's like, you're just doing it wrong. You know, whatever. You know, and they're, everyone's doing something right and something wrong, whatever. You know, there's a lot of right ways to do so. I think a lot of yeah, mushrooms absolutely. in particular feel like there's one way to do so, and that's the way that they were either taught or figured out how to do it. There's a lot of right ways to do something and a lot of wrong ways to do stuff too. Yeah. So you got to kind of, just whatever works for you and your team personally is going to make you better off. So yeah, I, I, I feel like me, me and Erica, especially we got like our logistical, like we're pretty well worked. Like, I don't know, for being relatively new to the sport, like coming to the start of these races and just seeing how utterly like, unorganized and catastrophic some of these teams that have been running for a long time are it's like all right well i mean we can get our team ready and booty and artist and like ready to run the shoot like and these teams are like running around with their heads cut off and like all anxious and like i, I i'm just what i train for like i'm calm i know what we're, we're going to do what we're capable of and just got to go out and do it like I know. especially like once you start the race and you're just running dogs like, all that stuff goes away and you're just focused on the dogs and everything so and uh, your setup at the kennel, is it you and Erica are uh, pro- like all doing all of the work? Do you have additional help or what's Yeah, so all last like? year it was just me, just me and Erica. Now we got Cody, Cody Waterbury. He's helping us out, helping handle for us. I mean, helping run dogs, you know, who would just have that extra help is just so much more pressure off myself because. Erica helps out as much as she can, but like I said, she's working a full time job because I don't work during the winter. I just run dogs, and then well, I do do tours later on. I'm starting here next month, I'll be doing the tours, but that's still running dogs and training dogs. So, like I said, Erica tries to do as much as she can as far as, and then just all stuff around the cabin. I mean, there's a lot going on here. I mean, just doing dishes, freaking getting the wood stove going, installing the generator, I mean, just shoveling driveway stuff like that. That's all stuff. I had to do this morning before I could go into town to run all the errands because my off day and just trying to maximize every hour of every day and just thinking how this will help me in March is like my forefront of my mind with everything I'm doing. So the extra help, like I said, Cody, just having another person run dogs, like it is so big. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. So now we can take two teams out at once, not me taking two teams every day or taking one big team every single day of the year and just rotating wrestling dogs out. That's what I was doing last year pretty much is we had our 14 that were run some of one's dogs as well. We had like a pool of 20 when I was running dogs every day. Like I'd run a 14 dog team, rest for six and then rotate those six in, rest another six. And, but yeah, I, yeah, that you get burnt out pretty quick or you can, oh, yeah. I don't know. This year is not different though. Like this year, I, like really enjoy it a lot more. Like everything is just, I kind of the mantra having everything just be a good training. It's really helping. But like, I will just think about the run earlier and just get so excited. And be like, I just want to go do that again. And that's like, never going to think, especially once you get into the longer days and longer train days, it's like, ah, uh, I just was out like all day yesterday. I got to go booty and harness and do everything. But, all right, and that, that extra help kind of alleviates yeah. some of that pressure. But Cody, yeah. Cody's such a good asset to have for you, man. He's 
he did it. He already got, uh, you know, Matt Pavelio, you know, and along with the help of another gentleman um, to the finish line, you know, obviously Matt did it himself, but you know, he, Cody was a huge part of that rookie run, right? Another rookie. Yep. And so uh, it's cool that he's done this ex- same exact dance before. And uh, so you're not, it's not just like you're just getting help from, a buddy who's just kind of learning what mushing is, you know, you, this guy can hop right on the runners and, and he also knows our, some of your dogs already. So, um, yep, yeah, yep. that's, uh, that's really cool. And, uh, I also got a re- pretty serious question. What were you for Halloween? Because the beard, I feel like you could have been Ooh, Gandalf. Let's go. You know? Let's hear it. <laughs> what was that for Halloween? I was trying to dog. That's what I was. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Make sure. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> the dude, I trick question. Trick question. question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we came back from a good answer I was like, oh uh happy halloween cody i, I guess it's halloween i don't know like i don't know like, that's yeah right. all that extra stuff kind of goes to the wayside it's like even being a vikings fan like yesterday was the first time i was gonna watch a vikings game like two weeks and i'm like a diehard vikings fan but like i try to just get right. to it as much as possible no we won we won okay all right yeah. Yeah. football come on all right yeah. man you beat Who's Joe Flacco. Team? Uh Falcons, baby. <laughs> Six Falcons. and three. Let's go. Cousins, fuck those cousins. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. We 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 play each other. He comes back uh into Minneapolis. We play at home the Falcons later on in the season. So be, oh, that'll be fun. That'll well be, you guys you know fun. how you know how it's gonna go. Atlanta's gonna get all excited because we're doing well, and then he's kind of gonna lay a goose egg when it matters most. So that's I've exactly been waiting. I've been waiting for the it's gonna have a strip fumble. Like every important game is just a strip fumble. Just a strip fumble. That's all it's gonna be. Like okay. you, you guys yeah. will probably make the playoffs. I mean, yeah. And then he'll just strip fumble it out in the first game and be like up twenty eight three and just lose it. Whoa, whoa, oh, whoa, oh, whoa, whoa. Oh, dude. Come wow, on, wow. wow. <laughs> you know we were having a good time with you. I was saying you really good that first fifty one oh, minutes. Oh my god! That, wow. Dude. All right, all right, all right, at least you got to wow. see them in the Super Bowl. I mean, I've never seen the Vikings right, get fat yeah. dancey champions. Trying to, so. trying I mean, to there was that one here, year but... where you guys were doing really well, and we beat you guys to go to the Super Bowl, like ninety eight. Oh, yeah. I think. Yeah, ninety nine. So. We were fifteen and one. Yeah, yeah. there we go. Ninety nine. Dante Culpepper years. Is that what that was? Yeah. Yep. So, All right, let's let's them, yeah. rather much for sure. <laughs> let's uh, I, I so I did have one question about your dogs. Um, usually we try to like ask about the dogs. Um, you said you have twenty one. Are it, do you feel good about the twenty one? Like you could, you can kind of maybe pick your your lineup from any of those, or is it maybe like only eighteen or sixteen of those are race ready? Well, I'll say we're running 21 right now. A couple of them we're kind of trying out. Uh, but, yeah, for everything I'm seeing right now, I mean, there's, yeah, a solid 18 for sure. Nice. Uh, major- I mean, I don't know. The majority of them are looking really good. There's there's a couple that are a little little crazy in a good way. I mean, once they're on the line and running, it's fine. But then you got to kind of look in the camp in your teams. And once you're actually stopping, and if, if, it's, if it's worth it on the back end. but no, I'm I'm super excited about all the dogs. When we yeah. first started training earlier this year, we had 16. So like, I gave I gave the dogs like a half hour speech about like, hey, right now like, you're all on my team. Like I don't know. I <laughs> it was like the halftime of like with uh, Kurt Russell in in the hockey movie. Yep. Or whatever. Yep. What is that? So that I, what is that movie? You know, Brennan. I don't. Uh, the it's only like hockey the, movie it's like I the know USA is like versus Mike, Russia. Mighty Ducks, dude. Uh, that's all I know is America. The miracle, yeah. And Kurt Russell was like, yeah. "I'm Kurt Russell. I'm 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 really cool, and I have a chiseled jawline. And you're gonna win this hockey game, you know, something yeah. like that, just like that." <laughs> um, so uh, related to the dogs, are they close in age? Are they? Are you got a wide uh, oh, they're, range? They're all over the place. I mean, we got dogs. I think from six or seven different kennels, just. I'll put together and now like now we've been at stack for a while like our our kennel has a culture and it's like super laid back and calm i mean we let all the dogs loose and they run up to the gang line like that's 
very important to me to have dogs capable of doing that, especially because that relates to training too. So like just this year already, I mean, we've had, I think three dog lines break and I've been running a lot more without neck lines. So you got dogs loose running down the trail, but they're so used to being loose, like as it is, that's not an issue. You know, you just, we had radar who's from Husky Homestead. He was in the lead and he just like, anytime he stopped, he's just, like did that and oh, broke yeah. his tongue. Harness banging. Yeah. yeah. No, he broke the snap in half from just harness banging. And then I was just like, all right, he'll be fine. Just like let him run free the rest of the way back. And like he would come back and be like, all right, radar, hold up. And like he'd wait for like the rest of the team to come back and like he'd get in the lead position and like just kept on going. So like <laughs> I don't know. And that that's the kind of stuff like I said, like that's good training in my opinion. Like one of them situations like that where you know it's going to be fine, but just getting them kind of a little outside their comfort zone, or at least outside what they're used to doing day in and day out. So that's kind of been my mentality this whole train cycle. Is like I remember doing a tour in the summer, and somebody asked me like, "Is there certain miles like you want to hit for the dogs?" And I was like, "Certainly, there are milestones, right? But I want to have every train mile be the most effective train mile as possible." So. That's really what I've been focusing on, especially early on in the fall training when you're doing like short four to six mile runs. It's like, all right, how can we make this the most beneficial six mile run? All right, like you tuna roll, you've never been in lead. You're going to go in lead, but your brother Barrett's never been in lead. I'm just like, spicy out, tuna right? rolls, your dog's name? Spicy <laughs> tuna roll, yeah. Hell yeah, yeah, dude. All right, that's the name of the year, right? That's, there. yeah, that's definitely a good one. What's a, is there any other, yeah, any other sushi of names? I don't know. What's up? Okay. Any other sushi names or no? No, no, no other sushi names. Uh, yeah, we got a lot of good names. Nice Miss Y, is good. like my favorite. What like, is it? I don't know. She's Miss Y. Her name is Y. Her name's just the letter Y. So we like added the Miss. We haven't named any of our dogs. They had puppies, so I can't take credit for any names, good or bad. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I, my yeah, favorite uh, is always. Always a fan favorite. That's, for sure. That is a good one. Spicy tuna roll. Brendan, uh, a couple of dogs that I've trained are on his, in those 21, G- G- Rambo and Goblin. And Goblin and ran the Rambo. Dog with me. And I've raced Rambo. Rambo in a few other events as well. And You're guys are like, uh, yeah. It's he was he run he ran up there, you know. He did he was the, he was he did he wasn't great, wasn't bad. He was in lead for my entire quest last year. So him and Y nice. work really like I give him all the credit for how well we did because we came down after coming down Eagle and getting into the overflow like he didn't even hesitate like we were running down literally a, a river like I was even sure if we we're on the trail and I was like we didn't even hesitate he just blew through it and I was like jumping up and down so excited to go through water because he didn't even stop like that just like nice. his intensity just like running down like just gets me so hyped like. Hell yeah! And then the dude. dog actually had Rambo and Goblin in lead for the finish. Sweet, yeah, I, yeah, I love those, those dogs. It's it's such a cool thing to to like. I mean, it changes from a dog's perspective. They go from like one group of dogs on with one group of humans and one property and one trail system, and then they go to completely other world. It's like going to a different planet, and they show up. That's Goblin and Rambo. Rambo's like, Goblin, who the hell are these people? Who are these dogs? Yeah. You know, and they plug them in and they're like, it's just a completely different energy. Their brain starts to kind of hit different new nodes and, and, uh, and it can, it, it's just a, like when you trade that baseball player that rode the, you know, not saying that Goblin and Rambo rode the bench, but they were, you know, team dogs for in our right. group and they, Hardly ever ran lead, but they were never bad at lead. They just weren't very good at it. And then you yeah, got new fights, and they're like superstar dogs that are yeah, better right. at it. And yeah, they're not gonna get put up there. But if right. they go and like, if they're like, you know, a B level dog, and all of a sudden like they're the top of the top, and then they like get the like all the sexy confidence, they're like this like this energy, like you're saying, like I don't know, it's super and super motivating watching, especially Rambo run. Like he gets me so excited. He look, yeah, it's, he's he's got a gate that's yeah. like. He just like he's watch. Like, he's got a nice him go up game, hell, dude. Just like, yeah, he's not oh, he's man. not like half ass in the pulling aspect of things. You know, yeah. some dogs, yeah. and it's good. It's you know, there is a good and positive things to pulling fifty percent of the effort that 
you know, because that, that you're going to be conserving and that's going to help you later. I don't want to be the one regulating that. But you know, it's good to have those dogs. I'm I mean, he probably regulates too, but you know, he's like in yeah, Rambo, yeah. dude. He's not called Rambo for nothing, dude. I've I know <laughs> dogs since he was a little a little little goober. I love yeah. for for anyone who's who's only listening, I love how like you guys just both had a, a very um excited look on your face, like talking about Rambo that how like just I, I just felt, it felt it felt palpable. Like you guys are just like very much vibing on Rambo. So, yeah, Rambo is like both mine and Eric is like his favorite like dog. Like just as a dog, he's also just got a look to him, dude. Like he's got like the like jet black hair. Like not yeah. like he's got something about it, dude. He's got like he looks like a greaser. Like he should be wearing a leather jacket <laughs> with tight pants, you know. And he's just yeah, like, yeah, too, man, like. You know, he's just got like he looks like a fucking badass dude, and he and is. then he's like he, he is, is you know, but he like you know yeah, it helps like, to look like one too, you know. When you look back and like if he's leading for Cody or Erico's are behind me, you actually like get to see them run, and you just like look back, like, damn, that dog is so fucking awesome. <laughs> well, that's the best thing. Like that's as as a musher and like looking back and seeing my dogs run behind me, like there is. Like yeah, actually getting to see their faces when they run, like just oh, their yeah. like, they're just you don't get to see that too much, you know. No. Yeah, that, that is you a get special to see thing. Your own dog and they're just dog fucking like happy, dog. dude. It's just like yeah, it's so you dope, see like, it. It's just undeniable happiness. Um. So we, Brendan, you want to get to the part where we we ask Keaton some weird off-topic questions to see? Uh, if we'll learn a little bit more because right, I got some. Oh, you 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 got something this time? Um, Probably. I mean, I don't have like a list, but it's off the top of the dome, dude. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's no list here. Uh, I mean, we'll just start with an easy you know, one. We, we're gonna wrap we'll just, things up, and you know, yeah, yeah. Sweet, look, some some quick, you know, some quick questions for you. We we'll just start with an easy one. Uh, give us your Mount Rushmore. Uh, uh in of uh, in the mushing world. Mount Rushmore. Uh, so... like, I think last time we did five, so hit us with five. All right. I would say Lance Mackey, like, definitely, definitely is up there. Just what he was able to, like, he gives me a lot of motivation. Just, like, if you go and do all the right things in the training, like, everything else will kind of follow suit. Like, you don't need all the crazy funds and money. Like, just go and train dogs. Like, so Lance Mackey's definitely up there. I mean, I probably got to say Jeff King, just because all the innovations that he's done for the sport and, his tenacity, he's definitely up there as well. Susan Butcher, we already talked about. Uh, I, I, I would say Norman Bond just because he's such a badass and was such a badass. Like, definitely was never competitive, but to go out and run, I did a rod when I think he ran his first, I did a rod at what age 80, 87, something like that, and summited Mount Vaughn in Antarctica at age 87, like that. I mean, you know, at 31, I feel like an old man, especially coming after the Marines. So, like, being able to do that that old is just insane. And then, I mean, Joe Reddington, just, I mean, the idea ride wouldn't be a thing without Joe Reddington. I really feel like we need another Joe Reddington-esque person to be coming along in the mushing community very soon because I don't know what the future looks like for mushing as a whole, but I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's getting difficult financially, especially. I mean, look at Iditarod. So post-COVID, everything has gone up. Prices exponentially. I mean, and you see the pool size go down substantially. I think, what, 21, 22 was the smallest pool in history at, like, in the 30s. Well, I, this year might be right now. We'll see how many people actually sign up coming towards the end but i mean that has to do a lot with the purse in my period or, or my opinion i mean purse has basically been the same since 83 or something like that but mid 80s and if you look at the cost of everything it's, it, it doesn't make sense to run i did a rod so i think some things need to change i mean i think these races need to get together and start working with each other and start instead of competing against each other and try to get something going where every, everybody's benefit, benefiting from everybody and get a lot more sponsorship, a lot more money into the sport. Because 
without that, I don't know if these dogs are going to be able to do what they love to do. Yeah, definitely finances are not just in mushing, but just across the country. You know, it's just everything's more expensive these days. And and then when you take something like mushing, that's a terrible financial investment already on a good day without it, the crazy inflation of, you know, then then you add that onto things and it's just like tough to pull it off. And so we're impressed that you're doing it. Um, what What's a one dog, uh, a dog's like personality trait that like the, with the quirkiest personality trait, like, like there's some, oh, some weird ass shit. I mean, spicy tuna roll is just crazy. I think Cushman, Cushman by far. So we actually got Cushman from Trailbreaker and he's got like Asperger's, like not, Actually, but Sorry, like, not the lap in it, but you know, it's just like, you know, you know like he's, he's like highly, highly just wound up. Like, I don't know. I remember I tried him out late March last year and actually ran him in the T Dog. And I, was, I don't know how this dog's going to stamp because he's just like, he'll lick you to death and just like always like going. And like, we finally stopped and he calmed down. And like, we had Cookie Doe's coming in the heat and she was in leads and then Walker was in wheels. <laughs> Walker was just dough. like sitting up just like, Panting at it. <laughs> it was like focused on cookie dough, and the customer was right in front of the walker, and like customer was just like putting his butt in Walker's face and uh, just like <laughs> the whole time. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what this dog is, but he's a lot. But like he's once you're on it, like he pulls. He's backing really up into it. another. He's backing his butt up into another dog's face, turning yeah. around and growling at the dog. Yeah, like, with a like, yeah. He's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's he's an interesting dog for sure. But Brandon, you got you got a you got another uh, one. Yeah, I got an easy one. Childhood celebrity crush growing up. Childhood celebrity crush growing up. Oh yeah, here we go. I mean, probably the first one was Britney Spears. I mean, that's nice. That's what yeah, the first thing I can one. really remember. Yeah. Uh, that might be Brennan's too. Uh, I remember. I remember a specific Britney Spears poster in your room, Brendan. Yeah, dude. <laughs> I mean, that was that was college, man. I I yeah I had had that one in the corner. Uh, uh, okay, we got. What's your favorite? Uh, or it doesn't have to be your favorite, but one like maybe one you're listening to now. But music. What's your What's your, one of your top music. couple bands? So like Biggie Smalls. Is like nice. that's yeah. Like, you and Cody probably music, can vibe uh, musically. Yeah, like I don't know. I, I like yeah, I like him, but I I listen to like absolutely everything. Like, you can ask Cody. My playlist is like pretty ridiculous. Like I got country, I got rock, I got hip hop, I got anything and everything. I got Taylor Swift down there. Like it's anything and everything. But as far as like Martin, I don't listen to music a whole lot. I listen to a lot more like podcasts or audiobooks more or less like audiobooks on like coaching coaching audiobooks leadership things like that or like extreme survival books like those things like put me in a good mindset when i'm on a trail yes yeah i like those too is the, the mountaineering books i find i don't know i don't yeah. like mountaineering personally but i like yeah. reading about it uh, you ever done mountain climbing i mean just like front range stuff you know i I don't think i think the highest i've ever been is like ten thousand feet and uh that was in not even it i was in south america yeah i think up here i probably only made it to five or six maybe yeah i've never done it but i lived in boulder colorado that's yeah i've been there once the greatest thing on planet earth like it it seems like pe- it, people get addicted to it like worse than heroin. Like they just go out and, like that's their entire life. It, the people really the go getters. I'm like I'm like secretly jealous, but like hourly I'm like, God, you guys are so lame. You just climbing mountains all the time. But in my head, I'm like, that's pretty sick. I wish I was doing that, but I totally could yeah. be doing that. But I'm not doing that because I'm a piece of shit. But anyways, continue, Brennan. With your question, what do you got? Uh, let's let's make this one of the last ones. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, I feel like we could go back and forth on these, but, uh, but you know. If I have a good one, I'll add another one. If you right take now, a good one. The dome uh, is completely empty. Continue. So, 
someone, either a musher or someone in the mushing community that you want to get on the podcast, but you got to help us get them on the podcast. <laughs> I've talked about them. No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I've never met. No, you definitely need to have tech on. I mean, yeah, talking about like ambassadors for the sport, I think what she's doing, I mean, yeah, she is doing a great cause for the sport as a whole. I mean, starting the T Dog, like that's like my first year, I ran three mid distance races, and two of them aren't even things anymore. So, like the fact that she came out with her own and she's Susan Butch Memorial race, like she, yeah, I would definitely get her on. And the fact that she like ran 700 miles of my dirt trail and she was like a lap, like after her mom passed, like that's Damn. pretty insane. Like that, it was, that molds you as a person, I'm sure. Like you, for sure, being a tough person the rest of your life if you do that at age 11. Yeah. Um, that's a good okay, one. I, Thank you. My, that's a good one. I'm going to say so the less heavy hitting one would be uh, your favorite, one of your favorite trail snacks. Trust Reese's, Reese's, anything Reese's. Wait, like a regular Reese's or like Reese's Pieces. You're talking Reese's, 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 not ready. Anything Reese's is good. All right, well, it's we'll reach out to Reese's guy. and see if you can get sponsored. Yeah, <laughs> any sponsors would be great. <laughs> yeah, if any potential sponsors want to throw Keaton like a cool 10 G's. Um, you just, you yeah, know, I'll reach out. Yeah. My balance sheet, if you guys want, I mean, we are very, very in the rest. So, okay. That would be great. Hey, what, what is there a good way for people that are interested in following your journey and your team and your dogs and I did around stuff? Is you have like a website, Facebook page or? Yeah. So we're on Facebook. It's Stargazers Racing. Uh, three words is our Facebook. We got our links for all our other social on there. What? The wife does all the social media. So we got uh, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, we got to go fund me on there as well. And then we're working on a website as well, which will be star racers or stargazers racing.com. So that will be here. Well, yeah. Keaton, I'm, I'm definitely going to be up at Fairbanks at some point soon. And, and uh, I'll be sure yeah. to be going and cracking open a beer with you and uh, Cody and, uh, yeah. And uh, so that, I really appreciate you. I know you're a busy, man. You got a lot of shit going on. So thank you for giving us an hour plus of your time. And yeah, I mean, you remind me, you remind me a lot of my uh, roommate in college. Uh, okay. Yeah, like a lot. I'll take That's it. That's a good thing. Okay, yeah. good, good, good. <laughs> nice. Well, yeah, man. Thanks for, thanks for, for being on. Also talk about other places besides Alaska, but mostly it's Alaska themed.